Today I stand before you as a man who lives life to the full in the here and now. But for a long time, I lived for death. I was a young man who believed that jihad is to be understood in the language of force and violence. I tried to right wrongs through power and aggression. I had deep concerns for the suffering of others and a strong desire to help and bring relief to them. I thought violent jihad was noble, chivalrous, and the best way to help. At a time when so many of our people, young people especially, are at risk of radicalization, through groups like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, and others, when these groups are claiming that their horrific brutality and violence are true jihad, I want to say that their idea of jihad is wrong, completely wrong, as was mine then. Jihad means to strive to one's utmost. It includes exertion in spirituality, self-purification, and devotion. It refers to positive transformation through learning, wisdom, and remembrance of God. The word jihad stands for all those meanings as a whole. Jihad may, at times, take the form of fighting, but only sometimes, under strict conditions, within rules and limits. In Islam, the benefit of an act must outweigh the harm or hardship it entails. More importantly, the verses in the Qur'an that are connected to jihad or fighting do not cancel out the verses that talk about forgiveness, benevolence, or patience. But now, I believe that there are no circumstances on earth where violent jihad is permissible, because it will lead to greater harm. But now the idea of jihad has been hijacked. It has been perverted to mean violent struggle wherever Muslims are undergoing difficulties, and turned into terrorism by fascistic Islamists like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, and others. But I have come to understand that true jihad means striving to the utmost to strengthen and live those qualities which God loves. Honesty, trustworthiness, compassion, benevolence, reliability, respect, truthfulness, human values that so many of us share. I was born in Bangladesh, but grew up mostly in England, and I went to school here. My father was an academic, and we were in the UK through his work. In 1971, we were in Bangladesh when everything changed. The war of independence impacted upon us terribly, pitting family against family, neighbor against neighbor. And at the age of 12, I experienced war, destitution in my family, the deaths of 22 of my relatives in horrible ways, as well as the murder of my elder brother. I witnessed killing animals feeding on corpses in the streets, starvation all around me, wanton, horrific violence, senseless violence. I was a young man, teenager, fascinated by ideas. I wanted to learn, but I could not go to school for four years. After the War of Independence, my father was put in prison for two and a half years, and I used to visit him every week in prison and homeschooled myself. My father was released in 1973, and he fled to England as a refugee, and we soon followed him. I was 17. So these experiences gave me a sharp awareness of the atrocities and injustices in the world, and I had a strong desire, a very keen, deep desire, to right wrongs and help the victims of oppression. While studying at college in the UK, I met others who showed me how I could channel that desire and help through my religion. 
and I was radicalized enough to consider violence correct, even virtue under certain circumstances. So I became involved in the jihad in Afghanistan. I wanted to protect the Muslim Afghan population against the Soviet army, and I thought that that was jihad, my sacred duty, which would be rewarded by God. I became a preacher. I was one of the pioneers of violent jihad in the UK. I recruited, I raised funds, I trained. I confused true jihad with this perversion, as presented by the fascist Islamists. These people who use the idea of jihad to justify their lust for power, authority, and control on earth. A perversion perpetuated today by fascist Islamist groups like Al Qaeda, Islamic State, and others. For a period of around 15 years, I fought for short periods of time in Kashmir and Burma, besides Afghanistan. Our aim was to remove the invaders, to bring relief to the. Oppressed victims, and of course, to establish an Islamic state, a caliphate for God's rule, and I did this openly. I was—I、uh, didn't break any laws. I was proud and grateful to be British. I still am, and I bore no hostility against this my country, nor enmity towards the non-Muslim citizens, and I still don't. During one battle in Afghanistan, some British men and I formed a special bond with a 15-year-old Afghani boy, Abdullah, an innocent, loving, and lovable kid who was always eager to please. He was poor, and boys like him did menial tasks in the camp, and he seemed happy enough. But I couldn't help wonder: his parents must have missed him dearly. And they must have dreamt about a better future for him. A victim of circumstance, caught up in a war, cruelly thrust upon him by the cruel circumstances of the time. One day, I picked up this unexploded mortar shell in a trench, and I had it deposited in a makeshift makeshift mud hut lab. And I went out on a short. Pointless skirmish, always pointless. And I came back a few hours later to discover he was dead. He tried to recover explosives from that shell; it exploded, and he died a violent death, blown to bits by the very same device that had proved harmless to me. So I started to question: How did his death? How did his death serve any purpose? 